Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'm Kelly Cleary. I'm Content and Programming Manager at Best Doctors, and I will be your host tonight. I uh, first need to tell you that Best Doctors is proud to be accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education to provide 0.75 AMA PRA Category 1 credits for your viewing this webinar. Please take a look at the disclosure information that we have in front of you right now, and stay tuned until the end of the webinar to hear how you can claim your credits. We're very excited to have an excellent panel of doctors uh, for you tonight discussing their own errors in diagnosing fatigue and how you can avoid the same errors. But before I introduce the panel, I'd like to say a couple of words about Best Doctors and how we're working to improve communication between doctors and patients. You need to know three things about Best Doctors tonight. Best Doctors provides medical consultations or second opinions through a unique and collaborative analytical process. If you're an elected best doctor, you're invited to consult on cases and earn an honorarium. And you should also know that we're holding a free pilot program in which physicians can initiate collaborations on their complex cases through an online portal that we've developed. So now, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Martin Samuels, our moderator for the evening, who will also be acting as our neurologist on the panel. Uh, Dr. Samuels is the Chairman of the Department of Neurology at Brigham and Women's and Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. A leading authority on the relationships between neurology and the rest of medicine, he has notably linked the nervous system with cardiac function, highlighting the mechanisms and prevention of neurogenic cardiac disease. Marty, thanks for joining us. Kelly, thanks very much. It's nice to uh, be here. Let me introduce our um, two uh, panel members uh, tonight, two very distinguished uh, panelists. One is uh, Michael Morse. Michael is a professor of medicine at Duke. He graduated uh, from uh, Yale Medical School, did his residency at the University of Washington and fellowship at Duke. He's currently studying the use of immune therapies in various cancers, including gastrointestinal, breast and lung cancers, and melanoma, and his clinical area of interest includes gastrointestinal malignancies, hepatic tumors, and immunotherapy and melanoma. Michael, welcome to our panel for tonight. Thank you. Uh, second is uh, Harris uh, McElwain. Harris uh, graduated from Memory University in Atlanta, Georgia, is board certified in medicine, rheumatology, and geriatrics. He's authored 28 books for patients on health, including topics on arthritis and osteoporosis, back pain, and fibromyalgia. He consults with Best Doctors of America on international uh, cases of fibromyalgia and other cases of arthritis and related diseases. He's also a pain expert for Dr. Oz's sharecare.com website, providing answers to questions for patients in pain. He's been a principal investigator for multiple clinical trials, including rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, lupus, gout, and more. He's currently in, the, in um, Tampa, Florida. He's an adjunct professor at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Welcome, uh, Harris, nice to have you join us. Thank you. Well, we've um, a number of people who have uh, who are listening to us have listened to a few of these um, uh, webinars. We've had a lot of fun uh, talking about uh, important topics in medicine, common problems, and we're um, we're studying uh, the the issue of cognitive errors, the the errors that we make in diagnosis, and so each of us are going to present some of our own mistakes. Uh, cognitive mistakes mainly, and thinking through uh, uh, important problems around this uh, very common problem of fatigue. I'm going to start, so I can uh, I can I'll reveal my uh, my error first, so other people can can follow me. Um, before I do it, I just want to, of course, state that this uh, problem of fatigue is one of the most common problems for which people seek medical attention in uh, doctors' offices, whether it be the emergency department or the primary care doctor's office or many different uh, specialties. And it's a very complex uh, problem with many different uh, aspects to it. We can't really cover all aspects, but I think our cases will um, help you to think through some of the common pitfalls and some of the caveats around uh, fatigue. So, uh, Kelly, if you can put up our first slides, I want to tell you about a case that I had relatively recently in which I uh, tripped over this case, and I'll uh, present it in pieces as it presented to me, and uh, I'll get the opinion of our two, uh, our two panel members. So this is a 79-year-old woman who uh, complained of five months of progressive fatigue, said she had difficulty climbing stairs, rising from a chair for about five months. Difficulty uh, 
combing her hair, began using a walker about a month ago. Problems progressed to the point where walking was very difficult, and she was admitted to the hospital. Next slide. Her past history included high blood pressure and hyperlipidemia. She had a stroke in 1995, which uh, left her with no residual. We don't really know the details of what that stroke was. She had stable angina and diastolic dysfunction, osteoarthritis, and had a, a right shoulder and hip arthroplasty. During this current illness, which was a matter of uh, sort of a subacute illness, really weeks to months, she had noticed bilateral leg swelling, worsening chronic hip pain, a 20-pound weight gain, and easy bruisability. Uh, she was newly diagnosed with diabetes shortly after admission to the hospital on this admission. There, were no his there was no history of any night sweats or fevers, shortness of breath, chest pain or rash, uh, loss of hair, constipation, diarrhea, cold or heat intolerance or numbness, incontinence, dysphagia, double vision or dysarthria. She was on furosemide and potassium chloride, lisinopril, atenolol, imdur, Norvasc, Celexa, and insulin. Uh, that was recent because of the, the recent diabetes uh, diagnosis. She didn't smoke, uh, didn't use any recreational drugs. There was no history of alcohol use. Her father died of a myocardial infarction at the age of 53. Next slide. So let me tell you what her physical exam was. Uh, this is my exam. Uh, her vital signs were normal. She was obese. She had facial edema. She had pitting edema in the distal arms and legs and multiple ecchymoses on her arms. Her Mental status was characterized really by what I would call inattention. She had trouble with, uh, with what we call working memory. She had trouble keeping things in mind for a few moments. She had no bulbar weakness. She had normal tone. There was decreased deltoid bulk bilaterally. She had moderate weakness of the upper and lower extremities, proximally mainly. Her distal power, I thought, was normal. There were no fasciculations, and when I... Uh, tapped on the muscle directly with my reflex hammer. Her direct muscle excitability uh, was somewhat decreased. So hitting the muscle directly caused decreased muscle excitability. Her reflexes were, were, were slow and they were diminished in amplitude. Um, absent at the ankles altogether, there were no Babinski signs. She had some decreased pinprick in the, in the, in the feet. She did not have any ataxia and she was very poor walking, really couldn't really walk without uh, without help. Next slide. So I'll show you her initial labs. You can see that her sodium was 143, potassium 3.5, um, chloride uh, 105, bicarb 34. B1 and creatinine were 29 and 1.0, and her blood sugar was 174. As I told you, she had a recent diagnosis of diabetes. And you can see her liver function tests. I won't read them to you. Her CK was 29, set rate was 9. She had an MRI at the time that I saw her, uh, which was really normal, and her EMG nerve conduction studies were normal. Next slide. So let me turn to our group and uh, see what you think this is. Then I'll reveal what I thought it was, and uh, then we can think about it a little bit. Any, any comments from uh, either Harris or Michael about what you think about this case? Uh, well, I'm going to start here uh, and understand as a medical oncologist, everything I see is cancer. So, uh, and that's pretty much all I can uh, speak to. The, this certainly has some elements of a paraneoplastic syndrome. Um, I would wonder uh, about, uh, although you didn't describe a rash, uh, whether this could be dermatomyositis or myositis, um, uh, which can be associated with melanoma and, and other malignancies. Um, yep. Some elements of her case uh, could also fit with uh, Cushing syndrome from uh, adrenocortical carcinoma. And, of course, we see this type of picture in people with advanced cancers uh, all the time, uh, particularly as the disease progresses and they uh, become more catabolic, they lose uh, their muscle strength. Um, so uh, I don't think it's uh, I could speak to a specific any other specific cancer based on well, that's, that. That's very helpful, Michael. So very I think very astute observations. Anything you'd like to add, Harris, or should I move ahead with the case? Well, I agree. As a rheumatologist, uh, when I hear proximal weakness, we think of dermatomyositis and polymyositis, which superficially fit. But I agree it. It's not typical polymyositis by the rest of the data, and I would agree with looking for a perineoplastic source. 
Right, that's great. The, the next, uh, thank you very much for that. Very uh, insightful, I think. Next uh, slide. So my, I thought that she was hypothyroid. I thought that she was because of her, uh, because of her weight gain and because of the edema, and uh, the slow reflexes, um, and uh, thought that she had hypothyroidism. That was my uh, clinical diagnosis. Um, next slide. So we checked her TSH, and it was 1.5, which was uh, which is normal, and we sort of had to regroup and think about it again. Next slide. And uh, some more history was was found, and and that is that the patient had noticed that she had some began to have a mustache and had to wax her upper lip uh, for several months. This was something that wasn't noticed on the original uh, exam, but she told us about this. She had a plethoric and swollen face, and her uh, IV sites refused uh, to heal. Um, next slide. So at that point, uh, it became clear what we were might be dealing with, and an AM cortisol was checked, which was very elevated. Dexamethasone suppression tests failed to lower the uh, AM cortisol. Her 24-hour urine cortisol was enormously elevated. The next slide. And um, her ACTH was uh, was enormously elevated. So she had an MRI of the brain, which uh, showed some enhancement, two small areas of the pituitary gland. Next slide. And then the um, obviously the scales fell from our eyes here, and I have to say, Michael, uh, is a very astute uh, diagnosis, I think, that you made of Cushing's uh, syndrome, and actually, in her case, it was actually Cushing's disease itself. That is, she was found to have a basophilic adenoma of the pituitary and underwent a uh, transphenoidal hypothesectomy, which actually cured her. Looks a lot like hypothyroidism uh, clinically, but the diabetes and the poor wound healing should have been a clue to the uh, to the uh, diagnosis, which I really uh, overlooked, I must say that I haven't seen very many cases of the basophilic adenoma of the pituitary. Even though I work literally in the shadow of the place where where Harvey Cushing actually did this work and made this discovery, and uh, was the first person to actually try to resect these tumors through the uh, transphenoidal approach, but I missed it, and it's um, one of those things that. Uh, uh, that uh, I should have known but didn't. Um, I think that uh, Michael's uh, pickup there was very good. That it was he recognized this was probably Cushing syndrome, which could have been could have been due to adrenal uh, adrenal tumors with uh, corticosteroid secretion. It happened that uh, this was actually a, the real thing, Cushing's disease with a basophilic adenoma of the pituitary gland. Are there any remarks about that? Any other remarks before I turn to uh, other members of our of our panel? So that was uh, that was uh, striking to me. Here I was, was sort of working in the uh, in the shadow of Harvey Cushing and didn't, uh, wasn't able to recognize Cushing's disease. Um, Michael, can I turn to you next and uh, have you present some cases? Sure. Uh, what I chose to do here is uh, describe uh, some cases where people presented with fatigue, uh, and initially uh, cancer was not considered in the diagnosis, and ultimately was found. Uh, so I'll start out with the fatigue, which was due to iron deficiency anemia, uh, which was actually due to a colon cancer that was not recognized at the time. This was a 46-year-old woman who had six months of what she just described as tiredness at the end of her workday. She had slight dyspnea climbing stairs, but this was attributed to her obesity. Uh, she also reported that she had had problems with restless legs. Her exam was unremarkable, but it was noted that she uh, spent the visit with a cup of ice in her hand chewing on the chips. Her uh, initial labs, uh, these were done before she came uh, ultimately to see me, but uh, she had a normal TSH and she was mildly anemic uh, with a microcytic anemia. Uh, outside uh, diagnosis uh, wasn't very specific. It was thought maybe she was having fatigue from her obesity, from being um, out of shape, so to speak. The anemia, she uh, had had some hev heavy menses uh, from time to time. Uh, now, eventually, and when she came to see me, she had been diagnosed with colon cancer. Um, as she uh, fortunately was followed and her anemia became worse, a GI workup was performed and she was actually found to have a sequel 
colon cancer. Can I have the next slide? Uh, the takeaway points I wanted to use uh, with this case are that the colon cancer symptoms that uh, the world at large is told about on posters and so on is abdominal pain, change in bowel habits, blood in the stool, but they're not always present, particularly early on and um, often with right-sided tumors, you don't have those classic symptoms. Iron deficiency anemia can be a presenting sign of colon cancer. Now, she had a, a confounding factor, which was uh, her heavy menses, uh, but she was probably also losing blood from her sequel tumor. Uh, and uh, the signs that she had iron deficiency, in addition to the microcytic anemia, which admittedly was fairly mild, uh, was fatigue and pica, particularly pagophagia, which has um, been seen in a number, of a number of studies of people with chronic iron deficiency. And also, restless leg syndrome has been associated with it, although I think it's still a little unclear whether it's truly related to the iron deficiency. I think that's a very cool case. I've had, I actually have a number of those uh, very similar cases. And if you look back in the original paper by Ekbaum about uh, restless leg syndrome, um, he actually recognized that, uh, that this could be related to iron deficiency. And uh, there were other pikas as well. I remember when I was a resident over at Boston City Hospital, we used to be uh, told, we were taught, to ask the patients about eating starch, amylophagia. Uh, and a lot of those folks would uh, keep uh, argo starch in their refrigerator. These were people with iron deficiency of other causes. Uh, but pagophagia uh, was another one, various different kinds of pikas. And it's very interesting that iron deficiency does produce these OCD behaviors. And I actually think myself that it's, this is the explanation for some of the unusual eating behaviors of pregnancy hmm. that uh, everybody in the lay public knows about, you know, pickles and ice cream, the old story about that. I think so. Iron deficiency produces a, um, a movement disorder, which Ekbaum called the syndrome of the restless legs, and OCD, these thoughts of wanting to eat things, unusual things. Uh, another one that people in the South know about, I think, is geophagia, eating, um, eating clay. And there were people who would uh, actually sell um, red clay, Georgia clay, which you guys must know about, right, to, uh, for people to chew almost like chewing gum who had uh, iron deficiency. Uh, and I, guess, I think this idea of the sequel cancer, and I've actually sadly seen another uh, a man, a man who, who had the restless legs who uh, has a sort of perineoplastic syndrome, actually was ha had a sequel cancer with a very slow leak of blood. So that's a very cool case, a very important uh, take-home message there. Um, Michael, would you like to present a second one? Because yours are sort of brief, and then we're going to go to uh, Harris for, a, for another one. Sure. Um, another case I chose was uh, to emphasize the importance of uh, screening patients and uh, making sure that people with certain chronic diseases, in this case uh, chronic hepatitis C and cirrhosis, um, are uh, carefully observed uh, and not allowed to progress to advanced cancer without uh, re recognizing it earlier. So this was a 67-year-old man with a litany of medical issues, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, and was known to have cirrhosis from a prior diagnosis of hepatitis C. He actually recalled after a surgery, he was uh, had a two or three month hospitalization in the um, 70s, I believe he told me, early 70s, uh, with jaundice. So presumably he got it from a blood transfusion that he required during that operation. Um, it, was, it wasn't for many years later that this was diagnosed when he was known to have elevated liver function tests on routine uh, physical exam. He had tried interferon, was not particularly compliant with it. Um, he didn't like the side effects that it caused, including the fatigue. Um, he was stable uh, for a number of years and then presented with worsening fatigue, increased abdominal girth, peripheral edema. Uh, he was anemic, but he had been anemic for quite some time. He had elevated tram transaminases and bilirubin, which were slightly worse than they had been in the previous year. And at that point, uh, he was initially observed. The feeling was that his cirrhosis was probably just worsening, and uh, all the symptoms could be attributed to that. Um, again, uh, fortunately or, or unfortunately, in his case, he, about three months later, 
He then developed worsening, quite severe abdominal pain, which led to a CT scan, and uh, a large hepatic mass was identified. His alpha fetoprotein was elevated, and he was diagnosed with hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, the the reason I wanted to bring this up is that, um, if you can have the next slide, um, fatigue is very common with hepatitis. Some studies suggest 100% of patients with hepatitis have fatigue, particularly uh, if it's progressing to cirrhosis. And hepatitis C is, of course, quite common in this country. Up to 3 million people may actually have it. AASLD recommends screening for HCC for pretty much any type of cirrhosis, and this patient had been diagnosed already with cirrhosis, or hepatitis B. Now, hepatitis B does not need to cause cirrhosis to lead to, to hepatocellular carcinoma, but hepatitis C almost always has cirrhosis before hepatocellular carcinoma. The recommendation is for at least an ultra, ultrasonography every 6 to 12 months. Perha- um, AFP is debated. Um, most guidelines do not include it as the only option. The ultrasonography is the recommendation. I, I think, sadly, there are a lot of individuals with hepatitis C out there that are unrecognized, but even more sadly, there are some that are known to have it that have cirrhosis, and um, screening is not performed to look for hepatocellular carcinoma until the, the masses are uh, not resectable, not transplantable, and sometimes uh, only uh, amenable to treatment with palliative therapy. Mm, that's very interesting. What, can I ask you just briefly, and I, I want to turn to Harris uh, actually to let him present a case as well, but um, what is your take on the, new, uh, the newest uh, drugs for hepatitis C? Well, this is supposedly, as I understand it, the only viral, chronic viral illness in human beings that can actually be cured. Uh, right. You say that's right? Well, um, it, it, it could be. Now, I'm not a hepatologist, so I don't routinely uh, treat these folks with those drugs, but we have seen uh, some patients who have had fairly dramatic uh, reductions in their uh, hepatitis C load. Uh, what is interesting is that um, I, I think it's becoming better accepted that if you can intervene and uh, clear the hepatitis, you have a lower risk of proceeding on to hepatocellular carcinoma. So in addition to the need to screen people to look for tumors while they're still small and uh, potentially curable, is this uh, possibility that we, we may be able to prevent hepatocellular carcinoma from becoming an epidemic as, as it has the potential to with a large number of hepatitis C-infected patients. Right. I mean, it actually is an epidemic in the world, isn't it? I mean, globally, it's a very, very serious problem, hepatitis C. Right, and, he- and hepatitis B as well. Uh, fortunately, some parts of the world where hep B was very common, vaccination is being used in- increasingly and fewer individuals will develop it. Hep C, of course, we don't have a vaccine for. Right. Can I turn to uh, Harris because I think we want to turn to a sort of a, li- a different, uh, slightly different um, angle on, uh, on the fatigue problem. I mean, there's so many different things. But, Harris, would you like to uh, take over and present a case? And- sure. Um, I-, I thought I would... Uh- talk about the problem of fatigue combined with pain, uh, which is something that rheumatologists say a lot. And we find it a very common uh, problem. A a patient that I was referred who is 42 years old, uh, a female, and she had a one-year history of fatigue, exhaustion, difficulty keeping up with her work as a teacher with children. Uh, She she had extreme fatigue, uh, difficulty concentration, decrease short-term memory. And can we have the next slide? Uh, she had pain and stiffness in, beginning in the feet and then gradually evolving to have pain in the legs and over her whole body is how she described it. She found that she had muscle weakness in the arms and legs, muscle fatigue with use. She had pain in the shoulders, the hips, the neck, and the back. And she even brought a picture with her, and the areas that are marked are the areas that are are painful, and as she notes, stiff and sore and squeezed uh, and tight. And on exam, she had no inflammation apparent. Uh, She had tender trigger points present, and she had multiple negative laboratory studies, and she actually had seen... Uh, a neurologist, an endocrinologist, and a, a her internist uh, before. Uh, 
laboratory basically uh, it was summarized before was negative, and she had negative nerve conduction studies, negative EMG. She had been treated with corticosteroids without improvement, antidepressants without improvement, and she all has had IVIG without any improvement. So uh, I think it's not a surprise as far as what this diagnosis is, but we find that it's really common to see patients who have a lot of severe complaints of pain and fatigue, and sometimes if we step back and look at the whole picture, we see the, the chronic widespread musculoskeletal pain, the tender points on exam, and the fatigue, and then I think what puzzles us all is that we routinely do laboratory tests and they're negative. And so uh, people have their A&A &A and rheumatoid factor and then multiple serologic studies, uh, multiple imaging, multiple uh, uh, referrals to tertiary care. And people come in with large amounts of material done. In fact, one of the, the, the signs of fibromyalgia, which this case is, is a person that comes in with a legal pad that's pretty full of complaints. That's a really great sign. But basically, uh, it's very frustrating for the patient because they have many tests and they're told they're all normal, so there must not be anything wrong. Um, if, we, if we look at the chronic fatigue uh, over lasting over six months, which is the definition, 60% or more have a medical or psychiatric cause. The psychiatric illnesses are most commonly major depression, anxiety and panic disorder, and somatization disorder. And what's really interesting, and I think actually good for physicians, is that only 5% of patients with chronic fatigue have their uh, picture clarified by doing laboratory tests. But isn't it interesting that we all do a lot of laboratory tests? Uh, and finally, it's important to remember medications because they commonly create or add to fatigue. Uh, and those medications that are used for sleep, the first generation antihistamines, narcotic analgesics, muscle relaxants, and antidepressants, we find that patients who come with fibromyalgia often have one or more of these medications as well. So if you if you've got chronic fatigue six months or more uh, that doesn't have a specific medical problem uh, or psychiatric problem, then it turns out that fibromyalgia is really common. Chronic fatigue syndrome, which is fairly uncommon but has very specific uh, criteria developed by the CDC, and in those who don't fulfill that criteria, we call it idiopathic chronic fatigue, and it's treated the same. Most physicians that have a patient with uh, fibromyalgia start running the other way because it's so hard to treat and so frustrating. We find that uh, once a diagnosis is made, it's not really necessary to have evaluations over and over again unless new problems occur. We also find that once the diagnosis is made, the patient usually feels better pretty quickly as much as anything from the relief that they don't have something terrible uh, going on. The, the most effective treatments we find are the physician relationship that can build trust and, and can give advice to the patient, treat their problems as legitimate problems that need to be evaluated. We find that the cognitive behavioral therapy by a clinical psychologist or psychiatrist is very helpful and helps the patient understand some of the, the factors that are creating the symptoms. We find that exercise is really important, starting very, uh, at a very low level with walking and strength, stretching and strengthening and gradually increasing. And some antidepressants may help as well. Uh, the, the three medications that are, uh, that are approved by the FDA for fibromyalgia, as you know, are uh, Cymbalta and Civella and Lyrica. And each of those gives a 50 to 70% chance of some improvement. So I think that the, the points that we find would be important, if we, a patient comes in with a lot of pain, a lot of fatigue, but no apparent answer, 
take a step back, look at it. If they have chronic widespread pain, they have some combination of soft tissue trigger points, and all the tests are negative, think about fibromyalgia because it may solve the problem, may cut the evaluation short, and offer up some very specific ways of treating. I'm really glad this, uh, that you brought this, uh, this up, Harris. I mean, obviously, this is one of the big issues in taking care of patients. All of us who take care of patients see this problem. Let me uh, uh, give you a question that uh, some of our um, participants uh, put forward, uh, and, um, and I think that will start some of our discussion around this. One of our participants asked, uh, sometimes patients will freely admit to major life stress but refuse to accept responsibility for or even consider the relationship to their perceived symptoms. What tips do you have for getting the, quote, the horse to drink, in other words, to get people to realize that there may be a psychological uh, component to their problem? What, how do you handle that, Harris? I mean, you, you obviously see a lot of these kinds of patients. It's a really great question, and that's one we all have when we treat patients. Probably most patients at first don't see the relationship between stress and anxiety and their symptoms. This is when the physician-patient relationship uh, of trust can begin to uh, make things uh, fall into place. Uh, There are some studies that show that Uh, Over half of patients with chronic fatigue were actually very dissatisfied with their care. And once that physician relationship uh, became established, they became much more satisfied and willing to discuss that. We find that if you treat the complaints as real and legitimate, they also become more uh, understanding and willing uh, to follow suggestions. Some studies have shown that... uh, Many patients with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia even acknowledge that there's a a psychosocial contribution to fatigue symptoms. And we have patients who, after diagnosis, uh, are very relieved and say, yeah, we're really helped that you pointed out those things. So it's not something that you can give a medication for or do something overnight, but building the physician relationship often helps. Uh, so that's I, I think this is very uh, this is this is sort of the essential feature of this uh, this this problem. I wonder if you could say what you think, uh, Harris. I'm asking you specifically about this. Uh, what you think the the pathology or the pathophysiology of of this fibromyalgia syndrome is? I mean, obviously, people over the years have have been interested in these trigger points. People have biopsy the trigger points, trying to find inflammation. They have been unsuccessful in finding that. Um, what, do you, what do you think this is? Do you think this is a, an entirely uh, psychogenic um, phenomenon, or do you think that there is something in the uh, periphery that's stimulating the central nervous system to react in this way? What is your view about that? It's, it's also the, the unanswered question in rheumatology. However, uh, it does appear that there are some objective changes that you can find on on uh, MRI. You can find objective changes in uh, in EMG and neuroconduction studies. You can find objective changes otherwise. Um, one recent study suggested, for instance, that the the muscle weakness that patients see with fibromyalgia. It probably isn't in muscles, but probably is a CNS product of an apparent uh, apparent muscle weakness. It, it follows often injury. It follows often uh, illness. The best thought is that there's a change in the way that the CNS processes pain signals so that signals that are normally painful become extremely painful and signals that are normally not painful become painful. What triggers that off is just not known. Yeah, a little bit like the migraine syndrome in a way that the, uh, and a lot of these folks do have also have migraine. As if exactly, the, uh, 50 percent have headaches, many have migraine. Yeah, they do, and I mean, it's as if the, uh, the thalamus or something has been misset so that, uh, so that uh, phenomena that are that ordinary sensory experiences that are coming from the viscera uh, 
from the uh, from the joints and other uh, locations are perceived as painful, and people become aware of. A lot of them are aware of their heartbeat. They're aware of their bowel action. They can they can uh, recognize things that uh, the rest of us don't uh, don't notice. Let me let me ask you one other thing before we. And I think we have time to go back, uh, perhaps for one last uh, uh, one last uh, case. Um, but uh, this I just was looking at the New Yorker tonight, and there's an article in there called uh, "Lyme Wars." about uh, borreliosis, about Lyme disease, chronic Lyme disease. And certainly up here in Boston anyway, a lot of people who have uh, a fatigue problem will be very concerned that they have some kind of chronic Lyme disease, with or without serological evidence for that. And I I wonder if you could, uh, uh, Harris, just briefly address the issue of borreliosis and and chronic fatigue. Yes, uh, because... Chronic fatigue often follows what appears to be an infection, and a patient's doing quite well. They're often very active. Uh, we have people who do marathons and then have sudden onset of terrible, exhausting fatigue. And chronic fatigue generally is defined as a severe fatigue, exhaustion, loss of 50% of function. Uh, and then the CDC has some other criteria which which makes it official. But... In looking for causes of this, infection seems to fit. Uh, and Lyme disease has been looked at. Epstein-Barr has been looked at. Other viruses have been looked at. So far, there's no specific evidence that there's one single uh, cause of it. But the effects of an infection, uh, such as Lyme, are, are commonly felt to be present. Many patients who have chronic fatigue syndrome related to Lyme or Epstein-Barr uh, eventually or may have the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So yeah. we, we don't know all the details of that. One of the, uh, there's, a, there's a nice little book that's written by a fellow named Arthur Barsky, who's a psychiatrist interested in psychosomatic medicine, about unexplained um, uh, medical symptoms, which I've found to be very helpful to actually give patients because it's a way of, uh, of explaining to people what it's like to have experiences which can't be explained uh, by the usual medical tests. And it gets back to your point about taking it seriously, taking these things seriously and considering them uh, real diseases, which, of course, they are, it's just that we don't know exactly uh, how they're mediated or where they are, probably in the central nervous system. Um, Michael, would you, you have one last one. Would you like to, uh, like to give us a one last quick uh, case before we uh, finish up? Sure. I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, Kelly, we, there it is. Um, so this is a fatigue due to hypercalcemia related to malignancy. This was a 68-year-old woman who was originally from China. She had been in very good health much of her life, but she was brought to clinic by her son because she had been complaining of more tiredness and lethargy, and she had had some back pain, which was attributed to her spending more time working in her garden. Uh, the initial workup uh, before she came to see us included a TSH, which was normal, or hemoglobin, uh, was uh, she was anemic, although apparently had been anemic uh, to the same degree for quite some time, and she had normal LFTs. And at that time, no diagnosis could be made. Uh, she was treated symptomatically for her uh, back discomfort. Uh, she uh, returned a few more times to her physician, uh, mainly with the pain complaint, but also was noted to becoming increasingly lethargic. And finally, uh, she presented with confusion and uh, at that time had a more complete uh, evaluation of electrolytes, which showed her to be uh, significantly hypercalcemic. Uh, additional workup showed that the uh, PTH was low, but the PTHRP was elevated and a uh, evaluation for malignancy was undertaken. Um, this uh, ultimately included CT scans, uh, endoscopies, and she was found to have gastric cancer with bone metastasis. Hmm. She probably had two reasons for hypercalcemia, the, perhaps the direct bone metastasis, and she also had humeral hypercalcemia malignancy as well. Uh, that was uh, treated uh, rapidly when it was uh, noted that she was severely hypercalcemic, and her uh, uh, most of her confusion and lethargy improved. She was still fatigued, which I suspect is from the advanced nature of her cancer. Um, but uh, this was, um, next slide. Uh, 
the, the takeaway points are that, uh, and, and we've all learned this in medical school, of course, the symptoms of hypercalcemia, polyuria and polydipsia, which I don't really believe she had, anorexia she did, but it, it could have been from her gastric cancer as well, nausea, constipation, and weakness, confusion, and coma. There are numerous causes of hypercalcemia. Uh, initially, uh, an attempt was made to uh, rule out hyperparathyroidism. Malignancy is one of the very common causes. Uh, and others that uh, should certainly be considered, toxicosis, hypervitaminosis D, milk alkali syndrome, which is almost never seen anymore, adrenal insufficiency, certain medications like thiazides, immobilization, and sarcoidosis. Uh, in retrospect, it was fairly clear she had a cancer and further questioning, she'd been losing weight for some time. Um, and uh, she probably had a helicobacter-associated gastric cancer uh, in the body of the stomach, which is quite common uh, in other parts of the world. So is that the reason, uh, just as an aside here, we're coming to the end of our time, i am always been interested in this uh, issue of the uh, high incidence of gastric cancer in Asian people. Is it supposed to be, is, is that mainly related to helicobacter? Yeah, helicobacter has become one of the major causes uh, that's been identified now. And if you, the, the, the confusing issue is if you look in, uh, some developing parts of the world, nearly 100% of people have helicobacter infections. So there, yeah. there must be other factors associated with it. Some people have identified certain, quote, virulence factors in certain strains of helicobacter that may be associated with causing more inflammation. And, you know, ultimately this is an inflammatory type process that proceeds through an atrophic gastritis and then a metaplasia, dysplasia, and cancer. Yeah, how interesting. Well, that's really uh, very interesting. Well, I think this has been a very, very interesting discussion. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Harris uh, McElwain, who was a rheumatologist tonight. We talked about uh, fibromyalgia, which is a very interesting potpourri, probably of, of multiple diseases. Michael Morris, a number of interesting oncology uh, cases uh, this evening. It's a it's a big problem, uh, fatigue. We've, we've sort of scratched the surface uh, just barely, but I very much appreciate uh, both of your involvement in this uh, discussion. I think it's really been interesting. Let me turn it back to uh, Kelly to sort of close the uh, evening off. Kelly? Thanks, Marty. Yep, that uh, that does bring us to the end of our 45 minutes, and I do want to be respectful of everyone's time, so we'll wrap it up. Um, we have several questions which weren't answered tonight, but the panelists uh, will be logging into our online portal to answer some of those, and we'll try to get all of them answered online and we'll be sending you login instructions uh, in a follow-up email tonight about how to, to do that. Um, so please remember to complete the survey that's on your screen right now. That will uh, let you request any of these slides or uh, the webinar recording or information about um, uh, consulting on a case with best doctors. Any, any of the things that we talked about tonight you can request here and it also helps us uh, continue to improve our webinars. So please do fill that out. Um, and you can also uh, request the 0.75 CME credit for uh, watching this webinar. Um, we have webinars like this once a month for the rest of the year on topics like abdominal pain, neck and arm pain, uh, dysphagia. You can sign up for these and you can also watch archived webinars at bestdoctors.com backslash physicians. So do be sure to uh, check those out. And I'd like to thank our fantastic panel. This was a great discussion, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Harris and uh, Michael. Thank you very much. It was great to meet you, and I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. Same here. All right. Well, um, thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you next time. Have a good night.